The spectra show not only that the same chemical elements exist throughout the universe, but also that the same laws of quantum mechanics govern atoms everywhere. Beings growing up on any world must come to grips with the identical laws of nature. Galaxies billions of light years distant evolve a spiral form. So does our own Milky Way. The same gravitational forces are at work. And on planets also, there are spiral storm systems on Jupiter. The same patterns are common on Earth. The intelligent beings on every world will sooner or later understand the laws of nature. Someday, perhaps soon, a message from the depths of space may arrive on our small world. If we wish to understand it, we first have to understand science. We do not expect an advanced technical civilization on any other planet of our solar system. If they were only a little behind us, 10,000 years, say, they would have no advanced technology at all. And if they were only a little ahead of us, we who are already exploring the solar system, then they should be here by now. To communicate with other civilizations, our technology must reach across not merely interplanetary distances, but interstellar distances. Ideally, the method should be inexpensive, so that a huge amount of information could be sent and received at very little cost. It should be fast, so an interstellar dialogue is eventually possible. It ought to be obvious, so that any technical civilization, no matter what its evolutionary path, will discover it early. Surprisingly, there is such a method. It's called radio astronomy. This is the largest radio radar telescope on the planet Earth, the Arecibo Observatory. It's located in a remote valley on the island of Puerto Rico. It sends and receives radio signals. But it's so large and powerful that it could communicate with an identical radio telescope 15,000 light years away, halfway to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Arecibo Observatory has been used although sparingly, to search for signals from civilizations in space, and just once, to broadcast a message to a distant star cluster called M13. But is there anyone out there to talk to? With 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone, could ours be the only one with an inhabited planet? How much more likely it is that the galaxy is throbbing and humming with advanced societies. Perhaps near one of those pinpoints of light in our night sky, someone quite different from us is glancing idly at the star we call the sun and entertaining just for a moment an outrageous speculation. There are an enormous number of stars. Only some of them will have planets suitable for life. On only some of those worlds will intelligence arise. And perhaps a few of those civilizations will avoid the trap jointly set by their technology and their passions. If there are many civilizations, one of them should be rather close by. If there are few civilizations, then even the nearest may be very far away.
This is one of the great questions. How many advanced civilizations capable, at least of radio astronomy, are there in the Milky Way galaxy? Let's call the number of such civilizations by the capital letter N. It's a number. It depends on many things. It depends on the total number of stars in the Milky Way. Let's call that um, N sub star. It depends on the fraction of stars that have planets. Let's call that F sub P. It depends on the average number of planets in a given solar system that are ecologically suitable for life. Let's call that N sub E. It depends on the fraction of suitable planets in which life actually arises. Call that F sub L. It depends on the fraction of inhabited planets on which intelligence emerges. Let's call that F sub I. And on the fraction of those planets in which the intelligent beings evolve a technical communicative civilization, call that F sub C. Finally, it depends on the fraction of a planet's lifetime that's graced by a technical civilization. Call that F sub L. If we multiply all these numbers together, we've estimated capital N, the number of civilizations. This equation, due mainly to Frank Drake of Cornell, is only a sentence. The verb is equals. So let's try to go through the program of this equation. By carefully counting the number of stars in small but representative regions of the sky, we find that the total number of stars in the Milky Way is about 400 billion. It's a lot of stars. What about planets? Well, in studies of double stars, in investigations of the motions of nearby stars, and in many theoretical studies, we get a strong hint that many, perhaps even most stars, are accompanied by planets. So let's take F sub P, the fraction of stars that have planets, as a quarter. Then the total number of planetary systems in the galaxy is 400 billion times a quarter, or 100 billion. We'll write down our running totals in red. Now, if each system were to have, say, 10 planets, as ours does, there would be 100 billion times 10, or a trillion worlds in the galaxy, a vast arena for the cosmic drama. In our own solar system, there are several bodies that might be suitable for life, life of some sort. There's the Earth, of course, but there are possibilities for Mars, for Titan, perhaps for Jupiter. If other systems are similar, there may be many suitable worlds per system, but to be conservative, let's choose N sub E equal two. Two worlds suitable for life per system. Then the number of planets in the galaxy that are suitable for life would be 100 billion times 2 or 200 billion. Now what about life? Under very general cosmic conditions, the molecules of life are readily made. They spontaneously self-assemble. It's conceivable that there might be some impediment, like some difficulty in the origin of the genetic code, say, although I think that's very unlikely given billions of years for evolution. On the Earth, life arose very fast after the planet was formed. So let's choose F sub L a fraction of suitable worlds in which life does arise as a half. In that case, the total number of planets in the Milky Way in which life has arisen once is 100 billion times 2 times a half, or again, 100 billion. 100 billion inhabited worlds. Now, the estimates get tougher. Many individually unlikely events had to occur for our species and our technology to emerge. On the other hand, there might be many different roads to high technology. Some scientists think that the path from trilobites to radio telescopes, or the equivalent, goes like a shot in all planetary systems. Other scientists disagree. Let's take some middle ground and choose F sub I as a tenth and F sub C is also a tenth, meaning that only 1%, a tenth times a tenth, of inhabited planets eventually produce a technical civilization.